Hey guys, uh, welcome to the STEMC Studio channel. In this video, we're going to look at the relative magnitudes of vectors which are in the same direction. Um, and we're going to introduce scalars and kind of like factor those into our vector class, which sounds like a contradiction, but actually um, it's going to move us in that direction of uh, creating geometric numbers. Now, this video that you're watching right now was a little video clip is actually recorded before the main video. Um, because I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, the first is a little sort of apology that at the bottom of the of the code editor, uh, you won't be able to see uh, sometimes the, the lowest line. I didn't get the sizing right on the video, but I like the video so much that I, I wanted to leave it as it is. I hope this is not too much of a problem, and I don't think it'll be a, a problem for two reasons. One is that um, generally the, the, what, the missing code will appear maybe you know a few seconds later, or if you're following this video yourself and you're kind of like coding along, then uh, it will be apparent to you what's kind of like going on. I really do hope you're, you're uh, following along because that is the absolute best way uh, to learn combining your math, your physics and the computation. It'll help correct errors. And talking of errors, the, another reason why I want to kind of keep this video um, is that I make some really I make two really silly logic errors in, in the video. You know, it's quite difficult to kind of keep your head straight when you're coding, doing these videos, coding at the same time, thinking about the math and then thinking about how I explain it to you. And, and I make mistakes and I make two, two silly logic errors. Um, however, uh, this will happen to you. I guarantee you'll make logic errors of some sort and you will need to get out of them. And you'll basically see how I can like back my way out of them. And in the end, we end up with the correct working code. And that's really kind of like what matters. So hope you uh, stick with that. One final thing that I'm going to say, and maybe this is more for, for, for the instructors and educators, is that the way that I'm uh, doing these videos, it's very kind of, um, it's intended to be intuitive and that we're building up our intu intuition. So sort of fumbling around um, to um, make sense of this mathematics and the computation. Um, and often what I do is I'll use the wrong mathematical terminology and I'll look at the videos afterwards and I'll kind of like, you know, I'll slap, uh, you know, <laughs> I should have used some different mathematical terminology and hopefully I'll correct myself in the video um, or I will do it in a subsequent video. I'm not that interested in going back um, in uh, and re re redoing the video at those points. And I think this is kind of counterproductive. I, I mean, I think this is the way that we, we're gonna think about these problems. We're gonna become more precise over time. So I hope you'll forgive me, uh, you know, when I don't get like, you know, the terms exactly right, but I hope I'll correct them later on. That also, leads into the idea that we're going to kind of be following here a much more intuitive way of um, entering into the subject. This is not an axiomatic approach where we start with some axiomatic foundation and we deduce the kind of like consequences because I don't think that's the best way to learn it. Um, I do think that has its place, but I think it can kind of like come later. So in other words, you use your intuition to get into it and um, get a foothold and you play with it, and then at the end, maybe you solidify the whole thing uh, by taking that axiomatic approach. Okay, with that being said, um, have fun in the video. Look for my uh, two gaffes um, and how I correct them, and um, the exterior product stuff will be coming up in the video after this one. Okay, take care, guys. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to the STEMC Studio channel and to another video in the Geometric Algebra in STEMC Studio series. In the previous video, we dealt with scalar multiplication and we were able to multiply a vector and effectively make it longer or shorter in its own direction. In that video, I also said that we were going to start to look at magnitudes and angles of vectors, and this would be the normal progression that we would do uh, in education. But I'm going to change that up a little bit. Um, I am going to try to convince you that we don't know anything about magnitudes and angles at this point in time. However, 
we may be able to make some statements about how the relative lengths of vectors that are in the same direction. Okay. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to find other objects, other mathematical objects that are lurking in this geometric plane and two-dimensional plane. And we're going to incorporate those into our vector class. So we will be incorporating the concept of this sort of relative size, which will be a scalar, as well as this new, um, new object, this new mathematical object, which is going to represent what we kind of think of as an oriented area. Okay, so our vector is going to grow. And I suppose you could say that the title of this video today should have been called multi-vectors, okay? So I'm going to stop short of calling this new object a geometric number. I've been talking about that before, like a geometric number as being the equivalent to like a multi-vector at this point in time. Um, and I don't want to call it a geometric number because that again suggests that we can measure lengths and we can measure angles and things like that. And we don't have this capability. But I think it's kind of important to realize that we can actually define all of the objects that are interesting in our plane, and it's way more than just vectors, um, without getting into lengths and magnitudes and, um, and, and angles and that kind of thing. So this video is going to break new ground for most people because most people don't have this introduction to, uh, to geometric algebra. So it's going to be super exciting. We're going to have this brand new vector class, which is going to become a multi-vector. And, uh, and then this is uh, our foundation is really starting to build uh, towards geometric numbers. Okay, let's get started. All right, so let's bring back our code. So we'll hit the show editors here and we'll take a look at our code. And uh, we'll also just hide the documentation for the time being. So uh, and let's hide the Explorer as well, make a little bit of more room for ourselves. So the first thing I want to do is I want to try to kind of convince you that we don't know anything really about the magnitude of our vectors. So say for, <coughs> excuse me, say for example, our vectors, our basis vectors in E1 and E2 direction. Now you look at the, the diagram here and you say, oh, look, David, it runs from two to three, right? To X is two to X equals three, or it runs here from minus three in the Y to minus two in the Y. So isn't the length of this vector one unit? Well, maybe is the answer. If we're in Euclidean space, then, you know, often the lengths that we see on these diagrams actually, you know, we can kind of relate them to, to magnitudes. But it's quite possible that the length of this might be something else. It's only a fact that the fact that we live in Euclidean space where Pythagoras, you know, the theorem of Pythagoras holds um, that, you know, that we think this is the case. I'm going to try and show you that by just kind of like doing a little bit of code. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to rescale this diagram so that it doesn't run from minus five, five in this top left hand corner to um, you know, five in the X direction, minus five down here. We'll rescale it to, to try to throw you off a little bit. And then we're going to hide the axes. So let's see how we do this. And this might seem a little, I'm, you know, everything I do here may seem a little slow and pedantic, but I'm doing it for a reason, which is that you will know how to kind of like code this. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be learning things about JSX graph as we go along. And, uh, you know, that'll make, uh, uh, you much more proficient uh, and able to do your own explorations. So um, here I am in the um, init board method of JSX graph um, on the graph object with the init board method. And we have these board attributes and the board attribute that describes uh, the range of this diagram is called bounding box. Now put the cursor there, hit control space bar, whoops, hit control space bar once, and I can select bounding box. And this allows me to basically define the range and it goes from like the X1, X2. Well, I can show you here. Let's see if I can show you here. Bounding box, there we go. Hover over that, there we go. Bounding box goes from X1, Y1 to X2, Y2, okay. 
And the default actually is minus 5, 5, 5, minus 5. So if we, oops, if we put that back, then uh, we should be back to where we started. And indeed we are. <clears throat> so now I'm going to try and throw you off a little bit. So what we'll do is re we'll rescale the Y. So let's say that we go from minus 5 to 10 and 10 to, there, we'll kind of keep it symmetric. Okay, it looks kind of weird there. Um, E2 is starting to look smaller than E1. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of remove the axes here. Okay, so now you look at this diagram with the axes removed and you go, hmm, E2 looks smaller than E1. The point is that, you know, the, the diagram, um, what you see geometric, geometrically um, is really just kind of, it's our intuition, unless we can kind of like concretely go from the mathematics to the diagram or diagram to the mathematics, then we may be deceiving ourselves. Okay. So we've got to be very careful about, um, you know, making assumptions here about, you know, is E2 actually perpendicular to E1, for example? Well, I could have skewed the diagram as well. And then you would be going, hmm, E2 is not perpendicular to E1, but you know, maybe that's not the case. So we will get to magnitudes and, um, and, and angles, uh, in an upcoming video, but all I'm trying to kind of like show right now is that, um, you know, you shouldn't kind of like read too much into what you see in the diagram. Okay. Let's go back. And the reason why I actually like to have the axes up is it, it does help me a little bit to, um, you know, to, to talk about what we're, what we're actually doing. Okay, so that, that was just a little uh, statement about what we're not going to do in this video. Uh, let's talk about what we are going to do. Okay, so I'm going to bring back the, uh, the vector A. I did just commented this line out before, and uh, I'll need to um, uncomment print line as well. So there's A. And then let's also bring back the visualization of a in the diagram and currently a is one along and two up now you may recall in our previous um, video that we have scalar multiplication now and we also have addition of vectors so we can actually kind of like be a little bit coordinate a bit more coordinate free here and we could actually replace this statement this vector um, one, two, by the following. We can say const A equals E1 plus two times E2. Okay, isn't that kind of pretty cool? Um, let's uh, just get rid of that. It says comment must start with a space. Um, again, nice software engineering reasons why we, we like to be consistent. I'm gonna get rid of that line in a, in a bit. I'm just keeping it so that you can kind of like compare the two. But if you look at this, we're really no longer dealing with coordinates. <clears throat> We're just saying that A is the vector, which is one times E1, just E1, and then add two E2. So it's take one E1 arrow and then add another two E2 arrows and you get a vector which is equivalent to A. This is completely independent of, of uh, you know, we're not really talking about coordinates now per se. So this, Again, it's just moving us in this kind of geometric direction where we don't deal with coordinates, but we instead we start to just kind of like talk intrinsically in terms of like the vectors and that kind of thing. Now, of course, we'll have to kind of like drop down to coordinates in two places. One is where we interact with um, libraries like JSX graph here, where we have to kind of like do some kind of like plotting. So we'll have to kind of like go from our um, geometric coordinate free representation of our vector to the uh, coordinate representation um, for JSX graph. And then additionally, to actually perform computation in our vector, we actually do have to kind of like choose a particular representation as, as it's called. And we just happen here to have chosen the Cartesian represent representation. Okay. So I'm just, uh, just making that kind of clear. 
Now let's go back to index TX. And I wanted to talk a little bit before we move on um, about this idea of like a relative magnitude, um, which we can have even though we don't have absolute magnitudes and angles and that kind of thing. So I'm going to change uh, A. So the A is in fact, let's say, make A twice E1. And let's make it nothing, zero E2. Okay, which is down there. And honestly, zero E2 is just, well, zero. And then you add zero and you get two times E1. Okay, so looking at the diagram, again, the diagram is sort of intuition right now. Um, A is twice the magnitude <clears throat> of E1. And, you know, we, we can tell that it is here, but wouldn't it be nice if we could actually divide A by E1 to determine the relative magnitude? So we could say const, you know, alpha, and alpha we want to be sort of like a number, is equal to A divided by E1. We, we would like to be able to do something like that. And then we look at alpha and we'd say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Well, I'm hovering over alpha at this point of time, and uh, it's kind of like saying, hmm, alpha's a vector. <laughs> uh, okay, this is basically operator overloading. Um, the way this operator overloading works is that whenever you use operators, you, or you always get something which is of the the final, of the, of the type that you're dealing with. And clearly, you know, it currently, that currently is a vector and that's not going to work, right? Because a relative, um, you know, a relative size, a vector divided by a vector, which is in the same direction, um, is just going to be a pure number, i.e. a scalar. So we need to grow our vector, um, before we can like even go, go anywhere here, um, into having the ability to represent both scalars and vectors. Okay. So let's, let's, let's think about how we do that. Um, first we should realize that, um, our vector name here is not really appropriate and, you know, we can perform a name change, um, in time. So we will do that. Uh, I'm just going to format the document, you know, kind of getting rid of a few warnings here. <clears throat> I seem to have a slight tickle in my throat today. So <clears throat> I apologize for that. No doubt I'll be ed editing those out um, of the video. All right, so let's go back to our vector. And we want the, the vector to have the ability to represent also a scalar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another property to our vector. Just like the properties that it already has. for um, the uh, X coordinate and the Y coordinate. So um, you can see that this has kind of really let the sort of the cat out of the bag. I mean, things are kind of like, um, have gone to hell in a handbasket, right? Um, by adding this new number and we, we're going to fix that up. Okay. But the way to think about this is that when this class, which is called vector right now is representing a vector, the value in A will be zero, but the maybe values in X and Y, of course, X and Y could be zero. That would be the zero vector. The vector that is, is, you know, it has no, um, I won't say it has no magnitude because that's not exactly truth. We'll find that out why later, but it's components, each of its components are zero. And if, and actually there's a theorem which says that if the components are all zero, um, in one representation, then uh, there'll be zero in in uh, in any other representation. Um, so uh, it is possible for for a vector to have its components zero, and we'd call that the zero vector. Okay, so that a vector would be represented by definitely an A here, and similarly a scalar would be represented by x and y being zero, and then A may be non-zero it, it should it should you know if it if it's a, a non-zero value then it'll have a value in there okay let's fix up this code here and let's kind of like get ourselves working again first so 
there is now this new argument a and it's the first argument so we want to put a zero in here and a zero in here so you can see that um e1 and e2 they uh, they they have the a part the scalar part zero um but you know they have the vector parts non-zero that's kind of like good and then when, when we're adding well if we had a vector and we add another vector then you know this this first coordinate the a coordinate will be zero and uh, again if we're multiplying a vector um by a number a pure number then we're going to get a vector so again a is zero and, and some of you will already be thinking hmm hey david this thing vector it's not really it's not always a, a just a vector um it might be something with a scalar part okay so over here shouldn't we be dropping something in here you know if this thing actually is a scalar it's like yeah definitely um you know this is what we're actually going to start sort of working on okay so um you know what should we call this um you know i'm um i'm going to do something i'm going to give it a temporary name okay so we're going to use the uh this really kind of like super handy um uh function here called rename symbol now the way i got to that i just clicked on vector right clicked with my mouse and i go to rename symbol and um i'm going to call this um <laughs> I, you'll explain this so there's a guy i'll explain this so there's a there's a, a guy called Josiah willard gibbs who who was the sort of the father of vector algebra and um in some ways he was also responsible for um an enormous amount of damage i would say um to future physicists because he simplified vector algebra and never allowed it to sort of escape from this idea that it's scalars and vectors and that's all you need um so um in honor of um Hosea, uh, we're going to call this a gibbs for right now and and it's going to we're going to rename it um when it becomes apparent what what a better name is okay so that's a gibbs now the gibbs is inside the vector class and i'm going to show you well actually let's go to um go back to our index ts you'll see kind of like rather cool is that um our gibbs um, has been renamed everywhere that's kind of really nice right we can we can just get on with uh thinking about this problem and um the tool is going to kind of like go with us pretty quickly uh yeah what should we re recall the file let's let's rename the file so you can actually rename files too um and um you know not i'm gonna not be very um creative here i'm gonna give it the same name i'm gonna call it gibbs.ts except <laughs> I'm going to use a lowercase Gibbs, um, and we'll do that. So uh, you can see it also fixed fixed up this for us, which is kind of rather nice. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll just go to that definition, and um, we'll say this is a scalar or a vector in two dimensions. And I'm not going to overly comment this at this point because... Um, you know, I think you, I've explained it already. And as we evolve, um, I think there'll be a more appropriate time for, um, for giving it kind of like better documentation. What I will do is I will just say here, I will just add a comment for what A is. And here, this is, X is the coefficient corresponding. And you'll notice I put a little P in there since our last episode, I dropped that out. Um, so a is the coefficient corresponding to now what is it is it a basis vector well it's definitely not a vector so hmm, it's not a vector okay and it's not e1 um it's actually it's corresponding to um let's shall we say one corresponding to one you know the uh unit scalar okay so a is kind of like the amount of of one so let's uh let's actually also kind of put that in here let's say um dollar this oops this dot a and then times one okay um ooh, <laughs> um plus there we go plus uh okay that didn't kind of come out too well if we look over here we've got zero one 
Um, let's let me try and kind of like explain what's going on here. So it's zero amounts of one. Okay, we could have we could have had another number in here like five, right? And then we would have got five times one. But five times one is just five, right? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to just remove the times one. Okay, and and so this is now. Um, how we should think about this new Gibbs thing, right? It can either be a scalar quantity or it can be a vector quantity. So here, A is a vector and it's got a vector part 2E1. We've got zero, zero E2s. Um, and again, E2 and E1 are also vectors, okay? But this part is zero. Now this is kind of like an, an interesting thing here, right? Because I, th I think, you know, many of you have had teachers who will say, you know, you never add a scalar to um, a vector, right? And that's kind of half true, okay? When it's true is, in this case, it's true that whenever we measure quantities, if we have a quantity that we're measuring that is truly a scalar like a mass or a charge or something like that, then it's going to be a scalar and it should not have any vector parts in in the number that we come up come up with and similarly if we measure something which is like a velocity or a momentum or something like that or a force then it should be a vector it should never have scalar components right so it's definitely true that when we have these measured quantities that we shouldn't be mixing scalars and vectors. We shouldn't have a scalar, a non-zero scalar part, and a non-zero and non-zero vector parts. However, you're going to find that in as we go forward, there are going to be places in intermediate calculations where it is possible that you have both a scalar and a vector part, and you shouldn't be perturbed too much by that. Um, when you do the final calculations and you calculate something that's a real physical quantity, you should get one, you'll get one or the other. Um, what we'll see is that addition, the, the, the plus that, that lies between a scalar and a vector is really just a good way of keeping things together so that we can do very simple and elegant mathematics, right? Now, whether there's a, there's a deeper, um, you know, um, a deeper physical meaning to the to the fact that we can actually create these numbers in intermediate calculations that are combinations of the two, you know, I mean, that would just be kind of like pure speculation. Um, but, you know, maybe there is. Because very often, um, I think there's a kind of like quote the, about the unreasonable effectiveness of math. You know, very often math um, can actually um, give us hints um, about better ways to uh, model um, the physical world. All right, let's kind of like finish. And my eyeballs just kind of like noted the uh, um, the comment here. So it construct, constructs the uh, scalar slash vector, <laughs> uh, scalar or vector, I don't know, um, which is, you know, A plus X times E1, Y times E2. Okay. All right, let's not uh, you know belabor that anymore. But you know, I think it, it is super important, and it's kind of like super sort of interesting as we can like um, increase the sort of flexibility of our minds to deal with these new um, these new physical objects. All right, what we'd like to be able to do is do this calculation where we take a and we divide it by e1. We're not going to be allowed to take a and divide it by e2 because they're in different directions. Or rather, maybe should I should say, if you try to divide A by E2, you, right now you're going to get a nonsensical result. And that's because we're going to kind of implement a sort of very poor man's division, if you like. So we'll start with this kind of like poor man's division. And um, <clears throat> it'll be good when things are in the same direction. But when we have the ability to deal with things in different directions, um, notably, you know, when we can do with angles and things like that, then uh, we'll make a better division. All right, so let's take a look at what we did. And I think what I'm going to do um, here is I'm actually going to um, I'm actually going to do something like this to start with, just to kind of like be consistent what we did before. A dot, and I'd like to say A dot divided by E1. Okay, now 
div doesn't exist and we don't have alpha defined okay so let's just uh print out alpha take a look oh and it's just like uh type error div is not a function okay so we're not even getting down to this line yet so let's go to our gibbs class it's now called gibbs class go to that definition or go to the file and let's implement div okay so if we go alphabetically here i think we should put div about here um and div well I know that div is going to return, you know, the div that we're creating here, we're only going to be able to divide a vector by a vector in the same direction. And it, in theory, it could return a number like that. Okay. But there is another possibility now that our div method could also return a Gibbs where the, the a part of the Gibbs contains the, the 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 ratio that we were talking about before okay so what am i going to choose i'm going to choose number or am i going to choose gibbs okay well i'm going to choose gibbs and i'll tell you why if i went over to here if i return number then i wouldn't be able to chain this to like something else um, i wouldn't be able to you know then add something and stuff um, now why this is why is this important well it'll actually become more important much later when I talk about the performance um, of uh, our mathematical quantities that we're creating here, our, our computational quantities rather. Um, but for now, I'm going to, well, I want to leave that flexibility in. Okay. So um, you'll have to sort of take this a little bit on faith that Gibbs is better than just defining number here. Okay. At this point we could have defined number and then we could have carried on and then we would have changed it later. Um, so no big deal. Okay, so we want to do division and we're going to return a Gibbs. So obviously we're going to return a new Gibbs. Okay, and uh, again, I'm going to uh, leave this idea with you. Okay, so imagine that you, um, are, you want to write a division function where you're, you're just only going to do it like a poor man's division where like things are divided, okay? Okay, so what are you actually going to do? So if you want to have a go at that, um, you know, don't don't worry if if you you know you, you, you could be wrong or right or wrong. Just kind of like uh, imagine what that might be like, um, and um, pause the video, and then uh, you can rejoin me. All right, so I'm going to implement this, and um, I think I'll do it this way. Um, so when we divide, I said I, I want to be able to divide the sort of uh, uh, like um, parts. Now um, I should have added here that we want to put a Gibbs in here. So sorry if I threw you off a little bit um, when I gave you this task before. I want to have a Gibbs on the right hand side. And I said that you know if if um, you have um, pieces that you know are in the same direction, then I'm going to sort of um, do the division. So. I'm going to take the, like, if this was A, if this was A, then this would be A, A's X, and then if this was E1, this would be E1.X, and I would get the ratio, right? Okay, uh, same for the Y. And you could kind of like, you know, let's kind of like just jump into the scalar part here. You can even say, look, if you had a scalar which was like 5 and 2, then I could go 5 divided by 2 and I get 2.5. So, you know, we could start filling out, for example, um, you know, what would we get if we had, if Gibbs was a scalar quantity and we divided. All right, so I'm seeing alpha goes to NAN. Um, have to see why that is. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah makes sense okay so uh what's happening here so let's go back to um to our to the problem we had we created a and then we wanted to go a divided by e1 and of course e1 doesn't have a scalar quantity so when we divide it by zero we get not a number you know this is um 
uh, this is uh, this is wrong. And oh yeah, and I've made a logic error right here, right? Because when I divide um, the vector two a by um, which is two e one, or, or rather a which is two e one by e one, the result should be a scalar. Okay, so I really completely made a, a mess of that. Let's get it, let's make this right. So when we divide in our poor man's world, the vector components are going to be zero and the oops put it in the right place david okay the vector po components are going to be zero and the scalar components are going to you know everything's going to end up as a scalar component so it should look more like this right so this part should all be zero and then we keep on adding stuff like that, right? All right, so what do we got? This dot A is, uh, it's that divided by that plus, hmm, okay. Uh, well, this is better over here. We've got 0 E1, 0 E2, but we've got a division, uh, let's see. Something didn't actually work out right here. Gosh, this looks like a total mess. How did you mess that up, David? Division. I want it to be this dot x divided by the right hand side dot x. This dot y divided by the right hand side dot y. Okay, better. And hmm. Okay, so I think the problem here is that we're getting these divisions by zero. So we don't want to perform the divisions. Uh, unless you know these things are like non-zero this problem is not going to be a problem if when we come to the generalized kind of like case so let's do something like this um, we'll go let a equal zero and we'll say if the right hand side dot a is not zero then a equals this dot a divided by the right hand side dot a and in fact i want to have plus equals okay and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my a value and put it in here okay um if this dot a not equals zero it's very hard to talk and type sometimes at the same time um, apologize okay we've got zero 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 okay this is better this is going to take us where we want to go okay so let's do uh the next bit if the right hand side dot x is not zero then add to a this dot x divided by the right hand side dot x okay got a two okay cool that's kind of what we're wanting okay um and then to complete it we need to do the same thing for y so there we go right hand side dot y not zero that will avoid the division by zero okay and then we divide by y okay and uh you know there you go so alpha is two so the ratio of a to uh e1 let's do that instead of like alpha let's say um a divided by e1 is that a divided by e1 is two plus zero E1s and zero E2s. In other words, it's a scalar. Okay, so uh, yeah, wonderful. Uh, we've um, managed to implement a, a very poor man's division uh, using, um, a, uh, using a method here, which we've kind of called div. Okay, um, let's just kind of like see some of the nonsense that we might actually get if we say divide A by E2, okay. Just take a look at that well we get zero in fact when we get our geometric numbers really going uh we're going to find that a divided by e2 is not zero it's something else um but um bear with me this is kind of like you know just uh we're doing this sort of the poor man's version right now uh what i will do just to um just to kind of like complete a little bit is i'm going to kind of like uh, evolve this so that we can actually use operator overloading so we're going to go const alpha 
equals a div e1 and we want to kind of like get the same result that we got just above okay so you've you've seen this before um, previous videos uh, you know the drill if you want to actually kind of like try to implement the um, operator overloading version um, then it's uh, double underscore div double underscore um, is the name of the method um, and like I pointed out in previous videos, you'll find the description of operator overloading. Uh, go back to the home page, user guide, just look on the, the right hand side here, you'll see a description of operator overloading. All right, so uh, if you want to have a go at that, do it, pause the video. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to implement it. So um, what I am going to do at this point is um, I'm going to sort of move my operator overloading functions down to the bottom um just kind of like trying to sort of separate out the bit of code that i use for operator overloading from the kind of like code which is like the normal kind of like methods right um, and I'm, otherwise i'm going to kind of like keep these in sort of alphabetical order just to to make it easier for me to find stuff okay so let's implement the double underscore div um, or uh, people call it the dunder d-u-n-d-e-r dunder div um, so double underscore div under um, with the right hand side being a Gibbs returns a Gibbs such a weird name okay Gibbs it's a scalar or a vector I guess um, and you'll not find this in in the text right uh, yeah this is just me making up something right now um, so what we want to do is we don't need to rewrite this again because div is already implemented up here. So we're just going to return this dot divided by the right hand side. Okay. And, uh, oh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. Um, unnecessary semicolon. We set up linting so that, um, so it doesn't, it says we don't need semicolons. Uh, we can infer them. Um, I could delete that, but it will actually vanish if I actually format the document. Uh, right click format, Control Shift I, as I said before. So here's Control Shift I, boom. Oops, not that. I need to keep the focus on my on my editor, Control Shift I, and it's vanished. Okay, that Control Shift I that I did with the focus elsewhere is actually popping up the, uh, the console for the browser. All right, so we have put underscore done the div in and uh, let's let's run it <clears throat> did it work and yeah cool um let's hide the documentation um a divided by e1 <clears throat> is two so um this is kind of like pretty cool um we could uh also um create if you like scalar quantities so we could create like um let's create a scalar quantity like const um, s equals new Gibbs and this time we're going to give it the value 5 0 0 so rec you just remember that what I said is that um, uh, a scalar quantity you know the way that's represented in Gibbs is I just have the um, the a value having something but the vector components must be 0 right and so if we if we try and print that then we will get s is hopefully s is five plus zero even blah 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 and um let's kind of like try and do like let's make t for example be um the scalar which is say two so here's t and we'll make that two and uh so there's t okay and now now let's kind of like do um, s divided by t so we can just print it out directly so s divided by e is s slash t okay and s divided by t is 2.5 and then there's no vector parts in that whole thing okay so um great a, a bit of a long-winded way of um uh, of getting to the point of saying you know that this class that formerly was called vector can really represent both scalars and vectors okay um and uh so uh 
now we we've we've got like this more powerful uh number okay uh, we can we could for example uh you can try this yourself you could for example create a scalar uh in fact we've got you know gibbs t here and we could multiply that by the vector now it might not work because you know why why might it not work well we haven't implemented it yet so let's try and do this let's um print out uh t uh or, or rather s which is five times a right so s times a so s now is a uh, is a gibbs a is a gibbs but recall that s is a scalar quantity five and a is a vector quantity so s times a and you know sad um we've got uh, uh something kind of like really kind of like weird actually oh it's um okay i'll have to figure out why this is but it, it's not working out and, and why is that well it's because our vector is probably not implementing multiplication completely ah okay here you go um we've got a method which is multiply by scalar and that's what we're using but um now multiplication with operator overloading is much more general right now the right hand side might be a gibbs or it might be a number so let's generalize that we've got a gibbs or a number okay and then the first thing you'll notice is that this complains all right so how do we uh, how do we fix that well we could do something like this we could say if the right hand side is an instance instance of a gibbs then we're going to perform something or other otherwise if the type of now we use type of when we have um when we have primitive types so if the type of the right hand side equals a number you know and uh by the way you know if we made a typo here then um we would get a warning like that so that's kind of like one of the cool things about using typescript here is that it, it uh, can help help us with that then what we can say is if the type is a number then we can actually use that mol by scalar okay and then in the final thing which is like well we don't know what we've got then i'm going to tell you that the the correct thing to do from an operator overloading perspective here is to return undefined okay it's not defined you know we we multiply by gibbs we we it, you know we can do something if we multiply by a number we can do something oh <laughs> and uh and if we if we um multiply by anything else then um it's not defined now here we can you know we've got the type system kind of kicking in and it's saying undefined is not assignable to gibbs okay um what we need here is actually that we're allowed to return a gibbs or an undefined okay so that we're using the or statement here the sorry the uh <laughs> and it keeps on telling keeps on giving us us errors until we get this kind of like correct so return a new gibbs let's just kind of like fake it here um zero 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 okay it's always good to kind of like get your you know get your code compiling first get it compiling first then get it correct okay so at least it kind of compiles <clears throat> um this is this is really this is how you're going to see these operator overloading things defined in future um if if you're allowed to perform the operation then you return the correct type if you can't perform it then you're going to return it's going to have the type undefined okay so colon means has type undefined okay now i'm going to show you here something a little bit different um but the difference between the word undefined used down here and the used up here is, is up here it's used as a type colon i'm undefined down here it's it's actually a value it's the value i'm returning and you're allowed to actually return undefined undefined is actually an okay value but there is a problem is that you can actually redefine the value it's actually possible to kind of like go 
you know, window dot undefined equals something else. And so I like to use void zero as a different way of saying it's undefined because there's no way this is ever going to be kind of broken. Okay, so we've moved along a little bit. Um, we've got this thing compiling. We're doing S times A. S is a scalar five and we want S times the vector to work. So what do we do here? So, well, clearly the answer is that S times A, a scalar times a vector should be a vector. So we're expecting that we should get some, some values in here. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say const X equals. Now, if the right-hand side is a Gibbs, okay, then, um, you know, the only only way only way we understand what the Gibbs to be is is that it's a scalar. So it's going to be this dot x times the right hand side dot a. Okay, I'm going to walk you through that again a little bit. Okay, so I'm saying the x value is going to be um, this this is x value times um, the right hand sides. Oops, sorry, I did it the wrong way around. I'm a scalar. <laughs> this is a scalar, so it wants to be this dot a times the right hand side dot x. Okay, so look at that again. S is a scalar, the left hand side is a scalar, the right hand side is a vector. And you can see actually we're getting the right value now, right? 5 times 2e1 is 10e1. Okay, so let's fill out the rest that would be there. Now this is only, you know, we're just like really, we're just kind of like creating the most poor man's kind of multiplication function here, but we're on the road to something that really is going to be super powerful. Okay. So we'll do it the same for Y. And in fact, you know, we could have S times T, right? S is a scalar and um, T is a scalar five times two. So, you know, let's, uh, let's take a look at that. We'll add a little bit more here. So S multiplied by T, S times T. Let's take a look and see uh, what went wrong there. Oh, sorry, just didn't quite quite refresh something. So S times T, and it says it's all zero. Well, that's completely clearly wrong. S, should, S times T should be 10, right? So it should be 10 here. Um, let's implement that. So what's missing here is const a equals, oops, a equals this dot a times the right hand side dot a. Okay. And uh, oh, we're not using a, that's why it's complaining. A is declared, but it's not read. We need to drop it into the right slot for it in the Gibbs. And hopefully now S times uh, T, yeah, we've got 10. Okay. So, um, you know, this is good. This is kind of like working the way it should be. And, uh, you know, at this point, um, you know, we've actually spent a fair amount of time on this. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot more to do. This is the, this is the really kind of like, um, you know, slightly, I guess in one hand, it's a discouraging thing. It's like, you're going to have to write so much code in this, um, in this class, this Gibbs class that is right now to do kind of like the most elementary things. But the thing you need to remember is at the end of the day, what you'll end up with is something that's like super powerful so that when you actually just use it, it'll be doing kind of like cool, amazing things. You know, this is, I think this is software. This is, uh, um, the way that software goes, it's like software is, uh, um, you know, 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration. Um, a lot of people think software is just about hacking things together. And, um, although we're kind of like, yeah, we're, we're, we're hacking our way through this and from the point of view that we're sort of building up our knowledge and intuition, um, we're not hacking from the point of view, like, you know, we expect something to come out in a flash. Okay, we spent a fair amount of time here and I think I'm actually going to um, call it a day there. You could actually play with this a little bit more yourself, um, but um, I'm going to sort of carry on. The reason why I also I'm going to say this, so let's, um, let's, let's conclude the video.
So the reason why I'm not too concerned about the fact that we're creating these kind of like poor, this sort of poor man's um, intuitive sort of implementation um, of our, our ultimately our geometric number is in a future episode, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to something called automated testing. And we're going to create a very systematic way to thoroughly test our number and to check that all the possible combinations actually work. Okay. Um, but um, for right now, this is kind of like, you know, good enough. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, already, I think you're kind of like starting to see that, um, you know, we're kind of creating a pretty interesting um, computational object here. All right, so I guess I should kind of like, you know, should have renamed this um, video to something like, um, you know, what do we do here? Um, we did, uh, I would say like relative, relative magnitudes. Uh, magnitudes, if I could spell magnitudes and scalars. Okay. That might have been a better name for our video. So hey, exterior, we didn't do the exterior product. Let's uh, change this to relative magnitudes and scalars. Okay, um, hide, uh, let's hide the code. Just take a look at what we got to. Okay, so um, uh, never mind that I spelled that wrongly. I'll I'll correct that. So uh, that's it. Uh, actually, this was pretty good fun, but um, you know, we're 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 actually doing great here, and uh, I hope you stick with the program because in the next one, uh, we are going to um, bring in another mathematical object from this diagram. So uh, don't forget, we actually did introduce another mathematical object the scalar okay so we actually incorporate the scalar into our um uh, our number thing that currently or, or or previously only allowed vectors so we're going to complete it um from the the uh, the number point in the next video this was fun this is fun for me i hope it's fun for you uh, i'll see you in the next video take care everyone and happy coding